We are, uh, everyone has a packet for articulations. I know with Monday, Wednesday, we started on already. Tuesday, Thursday, we haven't, but we're just going to go through it again. So, yay, more review. Um, <laughs> um, what else? You have a quiz on Wednesday. Please send me your answers to your study questions. I promise it'll help. Uh, your lab check, your uh, ligament speed dating thing is due today or tomorrow. Pretty sure you have a practical next week. Yeah. It's all on bones and articulations mostly. But don't forget that there's histology. Don't forget about ossification types. All those things are part of this. Are there any questions before, before we get started? Question? No? Oh, you're right. Your activities are due today too, right? Yeah. Yeah, the infographic thing. Upload, turn in by hand, whatever. I, the thing that I did it through, I showed you, like I tried to, like, when I finished it, I tried to publish it, and it was like, pay 20 dollars <laughs> to fucking do it. I was like, print it out if you need to, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, if you have it, or just resend it. So I, yeah, resend it. <laughs> I don't remember that, weirdly. Okay, we're going to get started. So to remind you where we, where we were, well, again, this will be a review for some of you. We're going over articulations. The word articulation is just a fancy word for joint. We're talking about when bones meet together. So we're going to distinguish between the different types of joints. Our textbook, or every textbook, goes over many different ways to classify joints. We're only going to go over two of those types of ways. We're going to go over how much movement they allow, and we're going to learn these names, synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. That describes the amount of movement allowed at these specific joints. Um, and then we'll also talk about the types of materials you find at these joints. I said it's whenever bones meet, but they might not directly meet. It might be bone directly to bone. It might be bone to cartilage. It might be bone to fluid and membrane. There's other things that could be there to support that joint. So we'll talk about what we find at those joints. So we're going to go over um, substances that you find at the joint and um, how much movement is allowed at each joint. We're not going to go over ball and socket, those type of things. We're not going to, I mean, you can learn it, but I'm not going to test you on it. Um, and then we'll focus largely on movable joints, our synovial joints, because that's what you think of when you think of joints. Those joints are specialized to allow for high degrees of movement. And that's, and when lab will do a fun activity to identify all those different things. So lots of different ways our joints can move, just like these things that we've created ourselves. We can move a monitor up and down, left and right, and rotate. This is what we would call, if this were, you know, a human body, this is a highly movable diarthrotic joints. Allows for a great degree of movement. Some joints, like this money clip, are, not, are supposed to move a tiny bit, like the clip can lift up a little bit, but it shouldn't move that much more. It should be very secure. So this moves a little bit. This would be called amphiarthrotic. And then some joints, um, maybe, maybe, could you turn one of the off a little darker? What, some of these joints, like this wooden, wood joint here, is meant to fit in very, very securely. That would be a joint that doesn't move at all. That would be a, um, that would be a sin, wait, yeah, sin arthritic. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Sin arthritic joint. <clears throat> So again, what is the definition of an articulation? An articulation is a is whenever you have two or more bones meeting together. There could be stuff in between, like here we see that there's cartilage and fluid and other stuff in between. There might not be any stuff in between. It just depends. So we're going to go over different types of joints. 
what we find with them and what that allows for that structure. So some joints, you have movement, some joints have no movement at all. The first type we're going over is called a synarthrotic joint. All that means, when you see the, the prefix, the root syn, like syn, synthesis or symphony, your, things are coming together and working together. Synarthrosis means a joint that's together. Synarthrosis. Synarthroses is plural. So if you see an ES, that's plural. If it's IS, it's singular. So synarthrotic joints are joints that don't move at all because they're, they're secure together. All these subheadings are different types of synarthrotic joints based on, how, based on what they're made of. So a suture, a suture has short ligaments in between it. You can find sutures only in your cranium. We've gone over a bunch of different sutures. Hopefully you remember most of them, like the coronal, sagittal, lambdoid. What's this one on the side? Squamous. Though all those four joints that I just mentioned, those are what we would call sutural joints. There is one more, the frontal. It's actually not a sutural joint. We'll go get to that coming up later. But most of the sutures that we discussed have tiny, tiny ligaments in between them, holding them together. Our second type of synarthrotic joint is a gomphosis. And this you only find, this you only find in your teeth. And once again, just like what we saw for sutures, it's just a bunch of these short little ligaments. The way your teeth are held into their sockets, what, what two bones would they be held into? Maxilla or mandible? Just tiny, tiny short ligaments holding them to the bone, surrounding that tooth. We'll get into teeth later when we get to the digestive system. This is as much as I want you to know for now regarding teeth. All periodontal means is, we've seen peri before, that means around, surrounding teeth, periodontal. <clears throat> so these two, suture and gomphosis, those involve ligaments. These two involve some a different kind of uh, a different kind of connection. A synostosis. Syn means together. Os. What does os mean? Bone. Bone together. A synostosis. This is where bone fuses with bone. We've mentioned how. Well, the, I, I talked about how the frontal bone, it, early in development, used to be two bones. We saw that on the fetal skull, but it fuses together to become one bone. And you see the frontal suture. So you see that it's called the frontal suture, but it's not a sutural joint. It's actually a synostosis because bone has fused with bone. So this is very hard and secure. I talked about how, can you think of another bone that you started out as separate bones but fused together? The, the, not the whole thing. The coxal bone, there we go. Sacrum, the sternum. I can think of one more. Close to the sacrum. Mandible, actually, mandible. Coccyx. So yeah, let me say it again. Frontal bone, mandible, sacrum, coccyx, coxal bones, sternum. A lot of different bones that we've mentioned that where you fuse, they're all fused together to form a single bone. Or when we talked about ep, uh, those, gro those growth plates, the epiphyseal plates that had cartilage in between, and then when it, through endochondral ossification, the bone fused together, became one bone. That's also an example 
of, um, that's also an example of a synostosis when bone meets bone. <clears throat> Another type is a synchondrosis. We've seen chondro before. What does chondro mean? Cartilage, yeah. So this is cartilage to bone. We've talked about how bone has articular cartilage. I'm not talking about articular cartilage. This is cartilage extending off of the bone and then connecting with another bone. Um, the one, well, there are two things. We've talked about the epiphyseal plate. So when you're younger and you have cartilage between bone, that is technically a synchondrosis, an epiphyseal plate. The one um, synchondrosis that I want you to know that we as adults have, it's your first rib, your first rib to the sternum. The other ribs, they of course have cartilage too. But we'll see that th this is actually a, mo a more movable joint and it has something else located at these joints. It's just the first rib that's very secure. For all these joints, sutures, gomposes, synostoses, synchondroses, the whole point of them is to keep things secure and, and to, to allow for some kind of protection. We want to protect our brain. We want to have our teeth secured as we chew. We want to have strong areas of our body like our frontal bone, our mandible, our coxa bones. We want to have a strong upper thoracic area. Yes. So um, something that is like a thing this joint at first, like when you're younger, does it mature into a synostosis? When you have a synchondrosis, if you're younger, does it mature into a synostosis? Um, yes, for your, for your long bones. Yes. So when you're younger, you have a, you have a synchondrosis in your long bones. It becomes a synostosis when you're older. You technically had more bones in your body when you're younger. They fuse together for uh, single bones when you're older. <clears throat> Those are synchondroses. The next one here is an amphiarthrosis. Amphi, we've probably seen that prefix before, like amphibian. What's special about amphibians? They can live on land and on in water. They can do, do both. If something's amphibious, it can do two things. Um, well, water and land. In this case, this is the in-between of our categories. Syn synarthrosis was no movement. The other extreme would be high movement. This is slight movement. Amphiarthrosis is slight movement. <clears throat> so we want these areas to be secure, but still need a little, a small degree of movement. Our first type is called a synthesis. Synthesis. A synthesis, you have fiber cartilage discs, wedges or pads in between. So your intervertebral discs, what's between the bodies, that allows only a small degree of movement. The intervertebral discs. The pubic synthesis between the pubic bones, that also allows for a small degree of movement. So not a lot of movement is allowed, just a little, little bit. Most of these areas are high compression areas. So you want some give, but not a lot. I know your spine can move a lot. The reason our spine can move a lot is not because of this joint. It's because of the joints between the superior and articular facets back here. We'll get to that in a minute. So this joint between the bodies <coughs> does not move a lot. It's more for support. Fibrocartilage, yes.
Another type of amphiarthrosis is called a syndesmosis. You'll notice a lot of these terms have syn at the beginning. I know that can be confusing, but if you break down the word, hopefully it will make more sense. We've seen this, this, this root before, desmo, like a desmosome. A desmosome link things together. A syndesmosis, it's linking things together. We see this between the tibia, sorry, between the radius and ulna and between the tibia and fibula. There's this very broad, thin ligament. It's a sheet of a ligament that's holding the two bones together, just securing them together. So radius ulna, tibia, fibula, you can find syndesmoses. It's a sheet-like ligament. <clears throat> the term for it is interosseous membrane. That's what the ligament is called between bone, interosseous membrane. It's actually a ligament. The reason why we can twist why we can turn our wrists over, that's a different joint. I'm just talking about holding the bones together. That's limited movement, just slight give. This is just for securing the bones together. Okay, last category, but it's very broad. Um, this is a diarthrosis. Diarthrosis is high degree of movement. With synarthrotic joints, we saw that there could be ligaments between, you could have bone to bone, you could have cartilage to bone. With amphiarthroses, we could have fiber cartilage or ligaments. With diarthrotic joints, they're all synovial. We've mentioned synovial as our fourth membrane but we haven't really discussed what it is exactly. We're going to discuss that now. All diarthrotic joints are synovial. There's synovial membrane with synovial fluid to allow for a high degree of movement. Which means there needs to be between the two bones. If you've got one bone here, got another bone here. In between the bones, there has to be a joint cavity. Filled with fluid. <coughs> what kind of fluid? Synovial fluid. So what are some examples? Basically, if you can move it, if you can think about moving it, it's a synovial joint. And there's and there's some that you might not think of, so that's why I'm gonna mention some here. I do want you to know names of joints. And for most of them, it's about knowing what the articulation is. So the term for your rib joints, and not the first one, but the rest of them, that's a sternocostal, because it's from the sternum to the ribs, sternocostal. In the back, that's costovertebral. Why do you need movable rib joints? To breathe. To breathe. Yeah, you need your, your, your chest to expand and, and come back. Humeral ulnar, what joint is that? Your elbow. Your elbow, yeah, your elbow. Femoral acetabular? Your hip. It's from the femur to the acetabulum, femoral acetabular. Glenohumeral? It's the move, highly movable shoulder joint from the glenoid cavity of the scapula to the humerus, glenohumeral. The highly movable joint of your spine, of your vertebrae, that's the zygapophyseal joint. You can call it a Z joint if you want. That, this is one I'll let, you, I'll let you to abbreviate. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know. So nice. 
Um, this is between the vertebrae, between the superior and inferior articular facets. So it's not between the body. This is a different joint. This is an amphiarthrosis. It's back here on the posterior side between the superior and inferior arti or articular joint. Uh, superior and articular facets. There we go. Yeah. For, um to like touch your toes, are you using the Z joint? Yeah, to touch your toes, what joints you're using? You'd be using your Z joints and your femoral acetabular. You won't be using, for when, like, in what circumstance would you be using the, the fiber cartilage between it? The fiber cartilage, would, they, would you be using it? You would, but they wouldn't be along for the most movement. They're there to just hold things in place and make sure that it doesn't get too, uh, too crazy. Okay. So this is maintaining the integrity of the spine so it doesn't move too much. This is allowing you to have some movement. A better movement. So when you pop your back, you're popping your Z. When you pop your back, when you feel that pop, it's the Z joints, because that's where the synovial fluid is. Uh, what, is double what does double jointed mean? It just means you're really flexible at that joint. Um, what, that, it's kind of a misnomer. It's more accurate if you say that uh, you just have like a really shallow cavity or really shallow fossa or long flexible ligaments. That, it's usually what that means. Is it, bad, like, Is it bad to crack your fingers? Generally, no. I mean, if you don't feel pain, we don't think it does. There's this process called cavitation. You're not getting tested on this. There's this process called cavitation. Because of the fluid in here, there's also gas in here. And if the gas accumulates and then you pop it, it creates a really loud supersonic noise, which is why you hear a pop. And which is why it takes a minute before you can pop it again, because the gases have to reaccumulate. It's called cavitation. We've only discovered this in like in the past five years. There's no, there's no hard evidence that it does anything bad, but that doesn't mean it isn't bad. It's just no hard evidence for it. Yeah. So like for my wrist, I can continually pop it over and over, but it doesn't hurt. But there's obviously not like a constant stream of gas. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, <laughs> It could be Carla dropping. If, if, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> if it, if you don't feel pain, that's cool, but I also wouldn't push it. <laughs> and remember, I'm not a doctor, so. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot of different terms for all these different joints. We're going to get practice with all these terms in lab. The full list of terms I want you to know, as always, are listed on the study guide. So please take a look at the study guide. Take a moment. I really want to help, but it's not working. Go outside. Just like Maybe how some I really wanted to find the other part of the <laughs> Did they find it? Yes, but now there's a missing hand. <laughs> well, you know, like, oh, yeah, we yeah. found the vertebrae. It, the was, hand, there's a hand. it was on the back of the desk. We're missing two. <laughs> Try outside. Maybe the internet's better outside. Huh? <laughs> Maybe your phone is not. <laughs> With 3G or 4G or 5G or? Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's your hands. Hands on three. One, two, three. Uh, take a quick second to your neighbors. Go ahead. I mean, assemble that box, but we save that for lab, though. Actually, we need a lot of help. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just hoping to get that done. Can, is it just that web website or can you upload or load other websites? Oh, no, they're just socks. Okay. All right, one more time, please. To your hands. One, two, three. On three, say the letter. One, two, three. C. Yeah, it's a diarthrosis, which are all classified as what type of joint? Synovial. synovial. All diarthrotic joints are synovial. Diarthrosis is talking about the degree of movement. Synovial is talking about the material. Okay? The, and they, they're 
one and the same because one's talking about movement, one's talking about material. Anytime we see like the two different types, so like a chromio clavicular, is that going to be um, a synovial joint? Anytime you see a, a joint where you see the two terms, is that always a synovial joint? Not necessarily. Like we saw like radio ulnar syndesmosis. So don't rely fully on that, but often is. <laughs> All right, one more, or maybe one more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand a few more time. Okay, hands on three. One, two, three. On three, say letter. One, two, three. Yeah, gomphosis. That's the only time you'll see that word when we're talking about teeth. Gomphosis. Okay. Synovial joints are special because they've got that special membrane and fluid. So let's take a look at synovial joints specifically. So shown here is just a generic looking bone joint, and that's what I'm going to do here, a generic looking one. Shown here is your knee, which has a fun name. It's the tibia femoral patella femoral joint. Yeah. Um, yeah, funny. So, okay. At the ends of each bone, so we're just talking about the bone right now, what, what we find out of the joint, you've got cartilage. That's called articular cartilage because it's at the joint, articular cartilage. What kind of cartilage is it? What type would like... It's not fibro. Hyaline. It's hyaline. Why is it hyaline? What is this a remnant of? What type of ossification? Endochondral. Endochondral. When we were when in 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 uh, early development, this all just used to be hyaline cartilage, and then we had those ossification centers. And then this is left over. This is left over. So, but they're protective. We need them to protect the ends of bones. Rheumatoid arthritis is when you start have this deteriorating. Or in general, when we have arthritis, we just have deterioration of the, that, that cushion. Um, what's immediately bordering this cartilage is fluid. That's synovial fluid. And that synovial fluid is produced, or it's, I shouldn't say it's produced, but you've got cells, simple squamous cells lining this joint cavity. You've got simple squamous cells lining this whole joint cavity. And remember with, synovial membranes, they have an incomplete basement membrane. So interstitial fluid can easily pass through. You've got simple squamous, you've got areolar connected tissue, an incomplete basement membrane. So it's easy for fluid to go in and out. So it's this fluid that's giving nourishment to the articular cartilage, but this fluid doesn't have as much oxygen and nutrients as blood would have, which is why cartilage here doesn't heal very well. So that's the joint cavity, right? Joint cavity filled with synovial fluid and lined with synovial membrane. Um, once again, the purpose of synovial fluid besides lubrication and shock absorption is to provide some nutrients. It's not providing a lot, but it's at least providing something.
What else can you find at a joint like this? Well, we have two bones connected together. If we have fluid in between, we still need the bones to be connected. So we have ligaments. Um, where's our ligament in this one? I guess there's a bunch. There's, a, there's, a, there's many different ways that ligaments can connect, but I'm just gonna show it off to the side here. You can have ligaments connecting the bone. You can have tendons. If a muscle is up here, let's say this is muscle. This muscle is being connected to the bone and that tendon can be found at the joint as well. So you'll find ligaments, um, you'll find ligaments, you'll find tendons at these joints as well. Fat is also really important here. We, so far we've talked about how fat's important in the hypodermis and the subcutaneous layer, but fat's also needed at these highly movable joints because we need cushion, just another layer of cushion. So you can find fat pads. Adipose. Guess I can draw that in. It's affecting me to get water on the knee. Uh, like, when, like, the, like, it gets, like, swollen. If you have swelling in your knee or any joint, that's usually because of trauma, like some kind of physical injury. Um, for a process we're not getting into, like if you get injured, basically interstitial fluid fills up that area and you get this swelling. Yeah. Um, so you have like knee surgery and then you have to like break down the scar tissue. Like what is it necessarily like made of it where it has like cracked? We're talking about scar tissue? What is scar tissue made of? Scar people who... Scar, who's the scar group? Collagen, Collagen mostly. So like, why does it make like a cracking noise when it breaks apart? Why does it make a cracking noise when it breaks I mean, you've got all these fibers that are together, and I'm guessing you're trying to loosen that up. Um, it's just very, very dense. It's very dense, and if you break up something that's dense, it's bound to make a noise. For your elbow joint, where would the fat pad be? For your elbow joint, where would the fat pad be? It would be somewhere in between. Um, I don't know if I can point to it specifically, but it's it's all surrounding. The, like this is the knee, I know, but it's going to be surrounding that bone area. Purpose is just to provide cushion. What is your like like? Let's just say my kneecap, for instance. Like whenever I do something, it still swells even it's already like shot as well. <laughs> Why is it so small? You're missing some kind of protection in that area, or it's just rubbing in the in the wrong way. Something's happening. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe you should check your running mechanics. How you run? Okay. This is true for most synovial joints, but it's not true for all of them. So what I just mentioned is true for all of them. Now we're getting more specific. Most synovial joints have something called bursi. Plural is bursi, singular bursa. In the joint cavity, that's where you have synovial fluid, but you have more synovial fluid in these bursi. They're just sacs that are outside of the joint cavity that also have synovial fluid. Just added... Added lubrication. So let's say we have like a large sac filled with fluid. That would be a bursa surrounding the articulation. Yes. Can they pop? Can they pop? <coughs> I mean, I'm sure anything can pop with enough force. <laughs> like if you have bursitis, you have an injury. You've you've injured that. You've damaged that. Ah. Uh, it hurts to move that joint. <laughs> is it weak? <laughs> I mean, surrounding this is interstitial fluid, so it's probably going to the interstitial fluid. I mean, it already is because synovial membrane is very leaky. Yeah. But you want that to heal so that you can get the amount of regular amount of fluid in. So it's kind of like a cyst. 
a, a normal bursa? I mean, a cyst is like an irregular growth. This is something that's meant to be there and provide extra cushion. It's like putting down, like if you put down a pad on, on your joint so that you can have that extra cushion, this is basically what's doing, what that's doing. So it's only on your elbow, shoulder, and knee. Is it only on your elbow, shoulder, and knee? No, I'm just showing that as an example. Most move, most synovial joints have this. I'm not gonna test you on specific locations of them. I would just want you to know that they are bordering most of your movable joints. Like I'm not going to make you identify the sub subacromial bursa. I'm not going to have you do that. But I want you to know that it's on the exterior, outside of the joint capsule, contains synovial fluid. Is that famous patella? Patella? Mm -hmm. Patella is a bone. Patella is right here. This is the knee. You have a you have a bursa outside of the patella. Another. Synovial filled thing is called a tendon sheath. So let's say here's our tendon. Surrounding the tendon, if you can imagine this like forming a cylinder around it, it's just encapsulating it and it's filled with fluid. It's just providing additional lubrication. Like imagine I'm wearing a sleeve, but that sleeve is filled with fluid. And then you can move the sleeve back and forth because it, oh, it's filled with that lubricating fluid. You can move it back and forth easily. That's what this is doing. Here's the tendon. Here's the sheath wrapping around it. And it's filled with fluid. Kind of like what we saw with the serous membranes. How the serous membrane is surrounding the heart of the lungs. Same basic idea, but now we're surrounding the tendon. We've got the membrane surrounding the tendon filled with fluid so that as a tendon moves, it uh, it doesn't hurt as much. If you've had tendonitis, then it's likely because you've uh, hurt, you've overworked this sheath. So they're just modified bursi. They're just surrounding the tendons. Yes. It's filled with synovial fluid also. So three places now where we see synovial fluid, the joint cavity, bursi, and tendon sheets, three places. <clears throat> okay, getting even more specific. An articular disc is something you find only in some joints. I will tell you two of them. They're right there. In some joints, you've got a bone that's separated by what's called an articular disc. So it's a disc of fibrocartilage. Because it's in between, now your joint cavity is separated into two. You've got a joint cavity here, and you have a joint cavity here. An articular disc separates the joint cavity into two. The reason for this, why we'd want this, is when you have articulating bones that are different shapes. So if they fit in really nicely, you probably don't need it. If the bones are very oddly shaped, like in your temporomandibular joint, your jaw, you want that added protection with a, with a fiber cartilage pad. So these are the two places I want you to know, your temporomandibular joint and your knee, which I do want to know the technical name. The term for your knee, since it are, it's your femur, tibia, and patella, it's your tibio, femoral, slash patello, <laughs> femoral joint. Your tibia with your femur and your patella with your femur. Tibia femoral, patella femoral. Me. Yes. Your knee region? You still have articular cartilage at the ends of the bones. That's hyaline. You still have hyaline here. You've got a fibrocartilage articular disc in the middle. There's actually even more fibrocartilage at the knee. Who remembers what that's called? Meniscus, which we're going over in a second. 
Do you, did you mean any other Highland cartilage? No. Right. <clears throat> so this is specific to the knee, the menisci. Menisci are these crescent shaped fibrocartilage pads. So that these condyles of the femur can fit in snugly and there's a lot of compression here. We want to support that weight. So you have a medial meniscus and you have a lateral meniscus. You have two on either, either knee. This one's specific to the knee, fibrocartilage discs. It's common to tear it if you twist your knee in a certain way. I tore my, my meniscus and so what they have to do is, it doesn't heal very well, so you, they usually just shave it down. Yeah, it's not great. Sorry? What does that do to me? It means I'm gonna feel my knee, pain in my knee more frequently and sooner than most people. Yeah. <laughs> can you replace it? It's not easy to replace. You can replace things like a ligament through surgery. There's no, at least not yet, a way to replace a meniscus. No pattern. Yeah. So meniscus is singular, menisci is plural. Meniscus, singular, menisci, plural. Take a moment. I'm trying to think what else you can do. You're back? Yeah. I get like a lumbar pillow or something. <laughs> if you need to stand up, does it help to stand? If you want to like stand in the back, it can help your back, feel free. Okay. Let's see what y'all think. Hands on three. One, two, three. Uh, talk to your neighbors real quick. My hint is between this right here, between tendons and the acromion process, which is a bone feature. So between tendon and bone. All right, one more time, please. Count on three. One, two, three. Uh huh. Interesting. <laughs> it went the other direction than I thought it would. Okay. Uh, okay. Anytime we want to reduce friction between tendons and some bone feature, that means it's outside of the joint capsule. So if we're talking about between like the articulating parts of the bone, that would be that would be a joint capsule. If we're talking about between a bone feature and something else, that would be a bursa. The answer is bursa. B. If you throw a baseball a lot, you're gonna get bursitis. That's why you gotta rest that arm. Yeah. The joint capsule is also a fluid filled sac, but specifically between the tendons and a bone feature. Joint capsule, bursa, and uh, tendon sheath. They're all fluid filled capsule. Yeah. <laughs> Question, Erica? So, 
a tendon sheath goes around the tendon that's just specifically protecting the tendon. But if you want to protect, if you want to protect um, the tendon and uh, a bone feature, that's a bursa. It could go over the tendon. It could go under the tendon. It, you could have a ton. You could have a bunch just sort of surrounding the joint. Like there's two shown here, but there's more than that. Yeah. Question? The tendon will never go through the bursa. If a tendon is going through a, a sack of synovial stuff, that's a tendon sheath. It's a tendon sheath. Is that thing that looks like, right? That looks like, shape like that. Is that a bone or a tendon? This? Uh, up further, a little bit. Like, yeah, that is part of it. And then the little triangle up above it. These are ligaments. Okay. These are ligaments. Bone to bone is ligament. So, so like, in, in like the elbow, um, if you like overuse it, it starts getting inflamed. Is that a so if you overuse your elbow, it's likely. Like anything that gets inflamed. I mean, it could be a number of things. If anything gets inflamed at a joint, it could be the bursa, it could be the tendons, it could be a strained ligament, it could be the muscle. Yeah, just has to figure out based on tests. But in general, you want to obviously rest it. Okay. Um, what do you do if you have? excessive damage to a joint so like maybe you know some of the hip replacement and in lab i can show you what a what a fake at least part of a fake hip looks looks like um shown here is uh what 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 uh what, what bone is this this is a femur that's the head you can see that the that the cartilage is kind of worn away so it's not so it'd be really painful for someone so in a hip replacement surgery you cut into the leg you separate all the muscle and stuff out and you can find the joint. You take the femur out and you shave down the acetabulum because it's all damaged. So there it is. <laughs> yeah, shave it down. You put a replacement socket in there so you got a new fresh acetabulum. You cut the femur head off. <laughs> and you put in the replacement head. And now you got this functional hip. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, so you, you, you do this to minimize any friction, and with, with minimal friction, there shouldn't be any pain, and, and the nerves are dying too. Yeah. So if you just like move the tendons out of the way, it's out of place. If you move the tendons out of the way, do these fire out of the place? I mean, what you'd have is, um, you literally just have like, what do you call them? You know how, like, you, if, whatever, if you're working on something, you just need to pull it to the side? You just oh, pull yeah. it to the side. So they get stretched out a little bit, but they can handle it. And then it just, and you just put it back, let it heal, it should be fine. <laughs> yeah. With amputations, remind me when we get to brain structure stuff, we'll talk about, that'll make more sense then. It has to do with, it has to do with the brain. Yeah, the nerves are gone, they're not there. It has to do with the brain. This is a really cool YouTube site. You should check this out if you want to see more stuff like this. Nucleus Medical Media. Neat stuff. All right. So the knee is one synovial joint that we're going to go over in a little more depth. I'm a little biased because the knee is important to me since I've had two knee surgeries. But I also think it's a really important joint because it's got all these special things. And So this is the one joint where I'll want you to recognize specific ligaments. Every other joint, I just want you to know that ligaments exist. But here we're going to point out specific ligaments. I'm going to erase this if that's okay. Again, when we say knee, the official term that we're going to use is tibiofemoral, patellofemoral, because it's the tibia, femur, and patella all articulating together. It's a compound joint. So it's more than just two bones, it's three bones all articulating with each other. Note it's not the fibula. The fibula is not included in this. The fibula only, on this proximal end, the fibula only articulates with the tibia, not. Not the femur. Um, <clears throat> th these, the, the femur fits in really nicely with the tibia such that you can lock it in place. Like if you, if you flex your quadriceps muscles, you can lock your knee in place. And that allows for more stabilization. Because um, you, you don't always want to, uh, you don't always want to think about balancing. By having 
these fit in really nicely, you can just kind of stand here and not think about it and bounce a lot more easily without without using a lot of muscle. Yes. Bow legged. That would mean that there's bend, like literal bend in your um, well. It could be a number of things. It could be if you horse ride a lot, so you're walking like that, or it could have a condition like uh, is it rickets? That's a calcium deficiency, and so when you lose calcium, you bow out. So you do have a joint capsule here, of course, um, and it's extending from this. If this is a femur, it's, it's it's from the distal part of the femur to the proximal part of the tibia. You do have a joint capsule in between. You do have menisci here as well. Um, so all, there's a lot going on in this one region. <clears throat> Other special things that you have, of course, you have those menisci. If you're looking from a posterior view of your left knee, so here's your fibula, here's your tibia. Highlighted here in red, that would be the lateral meniscus, closer to the fibula. Highlighted here in blue, that's the medial meniscus. Highlighted in blue. Here's a superior view of the right knee. You can see the patella right here. It's been pushed off to the side, pushed forward anteriorly. Here's the medial meniscus. Here's the lateral meniscus. Just adds more cushion so that those condyles of the, of the, knee, of the femur can fit in nicely. You have lots of fat pads. You have lots of bursae. Like there's a bursa above the patella, in front of the patella, below the patella, another one here, another one here, another one here. A lot of bursae to protect the knee. Again, I'm not gonna, I, I, as far as the bursae go, I'm not gonna test you on every single one. I just want you to know that there's a lot that's around the knee. Yes? So if you dislocate your patella, is that possible, right? It's possible to dislocate anything, yeah. <laughs> it would probably move off to the side. I mean, maybe you could tear this, which wouldn't be fun, but. Um, be moving off of this anterior spot. If you tore your ACL, we'll get to that right now. What happens if you tear a ligament? There are several ligaments at this knee joint. Whenever you have a joint that's highly movable, you want to have lots of ligaments to support it. The more ligaments that a joint has, the more secure it is. So number of ligaments means more stability, but also means you can easily tear one. Um, so there are one, two, three, four, five. one, two, three, four. There are seven ligaments that I want you to know. Seven ligaments. <clears throat> okay. If this is your tibia and this is your femur you've got two ligaments on either side uh, let's assume that we're looking at the right knee so fibula is here all right You've got one ligament on this medial side. This is the medial collateral ligament. It's just going straight up and down on the medial side, medial collateral. On the other side, from the femur to the fibula, you've got the lateral collateral. Medial collateral, lateral collateral. MCL, LCL. I do want you to know the full names. You can also call it the tibial collateral or fibular collateral. I'm going to stick to directional terms, medial collateral and lateral collateral. What's the region of the back knee called? Popliteal. So here's a posterior view of the knee. You can see on the models we have in lab, but we don't have this, unfortunately, but you can see that these two ligaments are crossing like an X. So this is in the back of the knee, only posterior side. There are two of them. They're both, we'll just call them both the top labial ligaments. Don't worry about naming each one, but know that there are two. They just form an X in the back of your knee, posterior side.
Okay. <clears throat> Anterior cruciate. The word cruciate means cross. Like crucify, cruciate means cross. Why the word anterior and why crossing? We're starting from the anterior of the tibia. These words for ACL and PCL are referring to the tibia. We're starting from the anterior tibia. And it's crossing because it goes posterior to the femur. So you start anterior tibia and you end up a bit in the middle of the femur. It's hard to show this in a picture when drawing it like this, but here's a tibia, ACL going from the anterior tibia, middle of the femur. So it's anterior relative to the tibia and relative to your body also. Let's start with the tibia. The posterior cruciate ligament, PCL, starts at the posterior tibia and then extends to the femur. So they're called cruciate because they're crossing each other. They're crossing from one side of the, of the tibia to the other side of the femur. Posterior cruciate starts with the posterior tibia to the middle of the femur. So this allows for more cross-directional stability of your knee. Medial, collateral, lateral, collateral, popliteal, those are two. Anterior cruciate, posterior cruciate. There's one more ligament. We haven't mentioned anything with the patella yet. The patella is here on the anterior side of the femur. There's a ligament that extends from your patella to your tibial tuberosity, this bump on the front of your knee. This is your patellar ligament. I know that we've all call, we all call it patellar tendon. I want you to call it patellar ligament because that's what it is. Ligament, what's the definition? Bone to bone, it's patella to tibia, that's bone to bone. We'll see on our models though, and what's true in our bodies is that this ligament continues over the patella and continues as more dense regular tissue, but it's gonna connect to muscle. So that would be called the quadriceps tendon. It's the tendon that's attached to these muscles of your femur. Quadriceps tendon, once you get to the patella, then it's a ligament. So if you hit this ligament, it actually also pulls on the tendon, which is what causes that kicking out reflex that you do with the doctor. So patellar ligament is patella to tibia, quadriceps tendon is from the muscle to the patella. So seven ligaments and a tendon, plus menisci, Bursi and fat pads, lots of things here to help protect the knee since it's such a high stress yet movable joint. Questions? Okay. Okay. Now that we've gone over, we've gone over all the basics of joint structure between synarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic joints. At, specifically at the movable joints, specifically at diarthrotic joints, what kind of movement is allowed? There are terms, there are special terms for, for allowing movement. I mean, we, we can just call all this bending, but that's not very specific. When we move joints, how can we be specific about the type of movement that's happening? So I want you to know these terms and we're gonna go over them. Um, Small bones, you can allow for gliding. Gliding is like, hold on, this motion, yeah. You can have slight gliding at small bones. So the carpals and the tarsals. That just allows for 
additional flexibility, additional give when you're moving these highly movable joints. Also your acromioclavicular, that's between the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula. So you get a little bit of gliding. Okay. Here are some more specialized terms. Once again, these terms are used specifically for synovial joints. If we want to move at an angle, so moving your, your glenohumeral, your femoral scapular, if you're going away from your body, that's abduction with a B. Like if you abduct someone, don't do that. If you abduct someone, <laughs> you're taking them away. Or finalian abducts you, there we go. Vanillin abducts you to take you away. We're going away from our body, abduct. Adduct, you come closer to your body. So you're adding it to your body. Abduct, adduct. Yes. This is only, is this only for your limbs? Yeah, yes. That's a, that's a, different, that's a different motion, which we'll get to. Yeah, this is for your limbs. That's just lateral flexion, though. I'm, I'm ignore that. It's lateral flexion. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, abduction and adduction. Very again, you can see why spelling matters. You need to get that letter right. Okay, flexion, extension, and hyperextension. That's just when you do it too much. Flexion is when you bring. When you make the angle of a joint with your body, if you make that angle smaller. Imagine that there's a line that extends like from my axis all the way up into the sky. You all, when you think of flex, you probably think of flexing your, your elbow, your biceps, you go like this. The angle is getting smaller between this line and you go like this. So that's flexion. You can flex your fingers, your wrist, your elbow. You can flex your shoulder. You're flexing your glenohumeral joint is this. From here to here is flexion. How would I flex my hip, my femoral acetabular? Like that. How about the knee? Um, backwards. Like this. This is flexing the knee. So all that flexion. Extension would be the opposite. So if I'm like this, this is extending. Extension. With your neck also, flexion, extension. With your back, flexion, extension. Uh, with your hips, flexion. Extension, this is extension. Hyperextension is if you're going too far. That's not usually not a good thing, unless you're double jointed, of highly flexible joints. That's a great question. I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's probably easier. Like they can less and less less things impeding them. Um, specifically, also for your limbs, I guess maybe for your neck. Um, if you move your arms or legs in a circle, either direction, that's circumduction. Circumduction. Like you find the circumference of something, you're finding the perimeter, the border, circumduction. <clears throat> if you dress along a central axis and you're just going along, spinning along that central axis, that's rotation. You can left rotate, you can right rotate. Same with your, same with your spine, with your, your vertebrae. <laughs> Wrist is different. Because it's not a central axis, we're talking specifically long wrist. There's a different term for the wrists. We'll get to that. Um, left and right rotation, that's just the head and uh, actually not a little bit of your spine. But this term is specific for your glenohumeral joint and your femoroacetabular joint. If you're moving your whole arm, I'm talking about the whole arm, not, not just at the wrist. The whole arm, you can have lateral Rotation and medial rotation. Lateral and medial. Again, it's at the hip or at the shoulder. Lateral or medial rotation. I have two minutes. 
I have two minutes. One minute. <laughs> Still though. Need you to pay attention. All right. With the radius and an ulna, since our wrists are a special joint, we have a different type of movement term here. Pronation and inclination. You've seen these words before. Prone is when you're face down, two pounds when you're face up. So when you pronate, you're putting your palm down. When you supinate, palm up. Like you're holding a bowl of soup. <laughs> supinate, pronate. Supinate, pronate. Supinate, pronate. The specific hand. If you go to a running store, you might use those terms to talk about your feet. We're going to use different terms to talk about your ankles. We're not going to use pronation and supination. Save these terms just for your wrists. Okay, there are a few more. We're going to go over those in lab. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in lab. See you all in lab. Bring your activity four and your lab checks. Thank you.